Welcome to the Dr. Mungo podcast. Uh, this is a special one. Um, you know, we don't really do too many of these in-person podcasts anymore. Most of ours, like just my direct to camera stuff. But the last couple, I've had a few people reach out to me, Nate being one of them, uh, who's going to be joining us. I'll tell you a little bit about him. And, uh, you know, the, the way this podcast started out is I would just feature folks who had like really compelling, inspiring stories. Um, and you certainly have one of them. So I'm super excited to share your story. You're an aspiring dermatologist. So, you know, man, that's, you know, I, that touches my, touches my heart. Um, but there's a lot of other, there are a lot of other aspects of your story that I think are just so amazing. So with us today is Nate Mariquin. He's a fourth year medical student. He goes to an osteopathic medical school uh, in Colorado, right? Mount yes, sir. Yep. Um, and he's, uh, you know, wrapping up his studies there. He uh, is applying for dermatology. And I got to know Nate because I was invited to be on a podcast that he, I think you're the producer or the chair of? I'm the chair, overseer, yeah. Um, and that's called the Dermatology Interest Group Association Podcast. Um, very official sounding name, but I recorded <laughs> that podcast. We did it like a couple months ago. But after after that, you know, Nate reached out to me and said, hey, I'd love to share my story on your podcast. And uh, I said, well, tell me a little bit about your story. And you more than made the cut, man. <laughs> it's, you know, I appreciate quite, that. Quite the story. So we'll get into all that. I mean, your story is like really inspiring on just so many levels. And I think it really speaks to, I mean, just overcoming adversity and all the things that actually I love speaking about. But yours, yours is like particularly interesting because, you know, like most folks, when they think of like a medical student, they think, well, you, know, you know, you go to college, then you go to medical school, and then you apply for residency. And it's just this linear sort of track, like right after high school, which I'd say is like probably 95 plus percent of students who are in medical school. Um, but then it's like a 5% who have a much more interesting story. Like when I was in medical school, there were folks who worked in finance and there were much older students went back into medicine. They were like feeling unfulfilled in their careers. Or there was like, you know, lawyers that just didn't want to practice law anymore. Or just folks that like when they were like 50 decided they want to go to med school or, you know, all, all kinds, you know, there were like a, a handful of folks that had like very unique stories. Yours is one of them because you basically were, you, your upbringing was a little bit, you know, rocky. I would mm -hmm. say, and you'll tell you'll tell us more about that. But you kind of had to support your family from like a very very young age, and you know we'll get into all the details why I don't like spill all, all the beans. But in order to do so, like you know the burden of going to college was just too financially debilitating for your family because you had to support them, namely your mother and your sister. So you enlisted in the Navy, and uh, you were in the Navy for how long? Couple, for like four, I did four, three four years or something. Uh, four years, three deployments. Yeah. Wow. So you've seen action. Um, so, you know, not only the adversity of your childhood, which was like you had really an impressive, like crazy story, um, which I think in many ways informs who you are, obviously. Uh, then you were in the military at a very young age, deployed away from your family, yet supporting your family. Then you came back and went to community college and then matriculated in college. Then now we're in medical school. So you're 32 years old, about to graduate medical school applying for like the most competitive residency program that exists. I, I still, there was probably still the most competitive program to get into, right? Yeah. So, it's like top three. So that's number one, man, you could say. <laughs> number one, definitely. There's, there's nothing harder to get into. Um, so you're certainly someone who's not adverse to uh, challenges. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, through all of this, somehow like, you know, you're a mountain biking guy and like you got in a bad mountain biking accident and you're paralyzed. You got a, overcome paralysis and this is i think while you were a medical student or before you were in medical school or right around right before school. right before medical school um yep. so not only was your life hard enough to begin with like you had a turbulent childhood you couldn't go to college because you basically had to support your family your mom and your sister and your mom you'll go into it but had some addiction issues that were you know, sort of you know sort of surrounding all of this stress that you had then you joined the military were deployed then you've like at an when you were like 20 something you went to college and you know community college and worked your way through college then you had uh, a mountain biking accident which left you paralyzed you had to like literally had to learn how to walk again and you were ba i think you were probably told that you weren't ever going to be able to do that yes, then sir. you went to medical school and now you're applying for the most competitive wrestling <laughs> program that there is so if there's anyone who speaks to the let's get it mindset um it's Nate. I think he does it much, much better than I can anyway. So welcome to the podcast, man. I know that's a long introduction, but your story is a pretty amazing one. That's absolutely okay. I absolutely am honored to be on this podcast. I think I followed you for about three years now on Instagram. When I found out I was going to go into dermatology, I, I went through and found who are the top dermatologists posting on Instagram and started following them. 
and you were one of them and I've consumed your content for the last few years now. Um, yet, and like you said, you were on that Diga podcast. We call it Diga for short. I have, we have 80 episodes, 30,000 plays on that show. Uh, it's been great. And one of my co-hosts did an episode with you and, and, and the way your episode went of overcoming things, going through hardship to be better. I was like, wow, I would love to share my story, story on your show. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to allow me to be here. And I like to say, you know, 32, but I feel like I've lived four different lifetimes and you kind of already touched on that. So yeah, you're, you're an old soul for sure. So I mean, I guess let's like kind of start. I was, there's like so many parts to your story that I'd love to get into. And I think, I think, I don't know if I'm, I might be speaking out of school, but like the part that you like kind of, when you reached out to me was, you know, overcoming paralysis and all that sort of stuff, which I, I get is like a, a huge part, <laughs> a huge part of the story. But for me, I always like kind of start from the beginning because like, you know, in order to overcome something like that, that's as crazy as that you have to be someone that's not averse to just overcoming adversity in general. And I, and I, I do think that the events of your earlier life, you know, earlier in your life, you know, like, you were close with you. It's kind of like very similar, but different from my story. Like I grew up in a single parent household. My brother was seven years older than me. My grandfather lived with us. You, know, you grew up with your grandmother. My mom was taking care of my granddad. You guys were taking care of your grandmother. I was the only, my brother was seven years older than me. So I was in the house predominantly like during those years. So I was in a very large, large part, like helping take care of my grandfather who wasn't ill. Like your grandmother was pretty ill. It sounded like she had diabetes. She must've had diabetes or something. She had glycoma and then yeah, diabetes lost her lower leg. She had an amputation and stuff. Yeah. Um, so and then you lost your grandmother, but like not even knowing this, your mom had like addiction issues, which you had no idea about, but discovered and you know, all kinds of shit. So what well, can you just tell us like a little bit of, about that? And you know, if you can kind of like, I don't even know if, it sounds like you've done all this because I read your personal statement that you're using for your residency. So mm -hmm. obviously there's a, a lot of introspection there, but I'm sure you've thought about how it like kind of informs who you are now. Um, but if you could share a little bit about that, I think that'd be really helpful for me and for everyone else to hear. Absolutely. You know, growing up and this was in my personal statement, you read this. I thought my mom was the strongest individual ever, you know, at a very young age, I can recall sitting at the breakfast table, the dinner table early in the morning on Saturday eating breakfast and my mom talking to me like an adult not just like a little kid like i told you no like this is why things are happening this is why you do things this way this is why you don't do things this way and in my eyes she was the and i love my mom and she still has her issues or whatever but she was this most powerful figure that i thought could never be beaten could could not falter could not do any of that and i wanted to live up to that in a sense at a very young age and my grandmother moved into our home. She had um, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. She had glaucoma. She lost her lower leg. She had a lot of stuff going on. And my mom was the one to take care of her. And me being the male, again, this is another backstory. I have three, two other siblings, an older sister who's 15 years older than me. My mom had her at 15. And I have a younger sister who's three years younger than me, all different dads. So it kind of talks about the background of who my family is and like the cycle. So I was the male figure in the house at a young age. And I helped my mom with showering my grandma getting her to the bathroom feeding her making sure she took her medications and you know my grandma ended up passing away in my sister's room and came to light that my mom was an addict to prescription medication and came to even more of a light that it's that wasn't new and a lot of people in my family had addictions with the alcohol and in and out of prison and all this other stuff and I knew that I didn't want that to be my life at a very young age because all the stuff my mom was talking to me about and teaching me about she was somewhat being hypocritical because she was doing all the things, you know, and she was doing more do as I say, not as I do. And I wanted to find a better future so that my future kids, when I have kids and I have kids now, I have two little girls, but that they wouldn't live through that life, that they wouldn't have that. And that was kind of my passion and my, my force and my motivation, and my, my, my discipline to keep going and get further and to get into school. Um, and that's kind of how I got into medical school and, and, and into undergrad. I knew I wanted to go to school, uh, knew I couldn't afford it. So I ended up joining into the military, like you said, three deployments, four years. I went to rescue swimmer school. My mom's addiction still stuck around. I paid for her rent, my rent in San Diego with my wife, paid for my sister to make sure she had food and groceries in the house. And it, it was just a, it was a hard time, you know, and I just, I did, I have my own personal podcast with myself, but I just did an episode about stress and it's, you do the little things each day. So that that stress doesn't surmount and get big and un unbearing. 
And I think that's what I did each day with that, with my mom, mom and my sister and having to have military burdens and then have my wife and, you know, and then future kids. And I don't know, I just think my mom raised me the right way, but she wasn't living that life that she had. And I think that's kind of what's defined me to who I am today. Are you like so close with your mom? That's what's sad. Uh, I haven't seen my mom in a five years, truthfully, uh, after I, it's going on six years and I broke my neck and my back, which we'll get into a little further. I was paralyzed from the waist down and I saw her once and she moved to Texas and she's kind of having her own issues and still struggling with stuff like that. Sorry. Any contact okay. with your dad at all? So <laughs> I don't know my real dad. Uh, I was in an accident or, you know, um, my dad that was around when I was a kid, I call him my dad as my younger sister's dad. He has his own issues as well. I think he's uh, struggling with a little bit of homelessness right now. And um, that's another thing. I haven't really seen him or talked to him in a few years as well. How about your sister? <laughs> my older sister. Um, we kind of had a falling out a few years ago, but I have two little kids now, four and two, and she's come back into my life. Um, my nieces, <laughs> they're a couple years younger than me because my mom had her so young and then she had kids young. So I have um, nieces that are like sisters to me, but she's such a loving person that she wants to be around my my daughters that our relationship has rekindled. My younger sister, she's fallen into the trap of addiction. She lost her son to CPS, Child Protective Services. Um, he's with the dad now and she's kind of homeless now as well. Jeez, man. Yeah. Like, you know, like heavy story, man. I almost don't even know what to say. I mean, that's... Uh... <laughs> So I, do you think like this drive and like, you know, you're kind of following, I, mean, I don't know you, but I'm assuming like you follow a pretty straight and narrow path, you know, just kind of a little bit. I do know about you. Do you think like you had your shit together before, like you went into the military or do you think? Oh, like, yeah, absolutely. Um, I come from a household where you got a good ass whipping uh, to, to discipline I did, you. I did. I did too. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you get a good ass whipping and you learn what's right and wrong that way. And you learn. The hard way if you do it wrong you're gonna get a butt whipping and i i learned discipline very early from my mom and how to fold the bed properly my 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 dresser couldn't have anything on it the, the clothes in the dryer the um my drawers had to be folded a certain way so when i went into the military boot camp was easy because boot yeah. camp is just teaching you how to follow directions and how to how to listen and how to to get in line because they gotta they gotta break you to build you and then i got out and got into got into the fleet and i made rank super fast just because yeah. A lot of people in the military know they're going to get paid on the first first and the 15th, and they kind of just coast. We call it skating. And I did a little bit more extra than everyone else, and I, I was recognized, made rank, got awards, went to rescue swimmer school. And I just think that foundation started with my mom putting it in my head that no matter who you are, where you're from, no matter what color skin you are, you could be from Mars. If you bust your ass, no one can take that from you, and you'll be successful. And I've just carried that mantra for the rest of my life and for my entire life so far, and I can can plan to can carry it for the rest of my life and i think that's what's made me be I, I success can be defined how you want it to be defined right but i think i've been successful in every endeavor that i've done so far because of that mantra was your mom from like a military background in some way like her no folks or she, like that? her uh her dad was just a, a, a hard ass and you know basically loved with a, a open heart but a heavy hand that's what she always said yeah. big heart heavy hand um and discipline that way but that's also, I think, what made my mom rebel at a very young age and get pregnant at a young age and fall into drugs at a young age as well. Um, and again, my mom is a loving person. She did her best. We had a, a, a nice home. She kind of was one of those, like, I'm faking this image, but hiding what I'm really doing. Uh, but I think that she, her discipline from her dad has carried off to me. And I always tell my wife this, is that she was telling me all the stuff her dad told her, but none of her and her siblings really listened. And I'm the one in my family that listened and has carried on and now is going to make that that change. One of my favorite entrepreneurs is um, Ed Milet. He has a book called One, yeah. The Power of One More. And he talks about in that book is there's one person in a generation. You see these people who have all this wealth and all this, all this life and these cars and these big houses. But somewhere in that lineage, they weren't rich. They didn't have all that money. They didn't have these cars and, and wealth. There was one person that made the change. And I've recognized me as that person in my family. Maybe I won't be the most richest person in the world or anything, but my daughters and my grandkids will now have a generational wealth that will carry them to success in the future. Love that, man. Yeah, I follow I I think you spoke to him a couple of times. Uh, awesome. An inspiring guy. Yeah. Wow, man. So then did you like think about like, you know, like 
you knew you were going to go into the military we were like what the hell am i going to do this is like my only option right now i mean that's a big decision my mom was actually a colonel in the army reserves oh thank you um, thank you thank her for being back so yeah. Yeah, thank, thank both you guys for, for, yeah. for all yeah. your service um but it's a, i mean for her if she was in the reserves right so it was like not it was a, a commitment you know she had to go a couple of weeks a year and you know a, a one week in a month type of thing i remember we were growing up we'd always go to like germany and stuff like during our vacations and, mm -hmm. stuff, and stuff like that when she was serving um but you know there were times like it was right during the first it was during the first iraq war and she was you know active you know she was in the military and there was chance that she might get you know called up and it was obviously mm -hmm. was very scary i mean you've been deployed so you know so that, that's like a heavy decision man for like a 18 year old mm -hmm. and say hey this is what i'm going to do it's like what made you do it so i got into a few schools i'm originally from southern california grew up side of, outside of la um obviously i joined the military moved down to san diego so i consider san diego home but i was going to school out here and I knew I wanted to get out of this little town outside of LA and I got into five schools. I got into CSUN, I got into Monterey Bay, I got into San Jose, I got into Colorado State, and I think I got into one more school, I can't remember. Uh, but I committed to San Jose State and every day got closer and closer. I was like, how am I gonna pay for this? How's this gonna happen? How is this gonna put this stress on my mom and my sister? Um, you know, I, I kind of put that into perspective. And I was like, well, my cousin joined the military. She's already been about a year in. I was like, what branch can I join that, you know, is going to give me the opportunity to be successful in the future if that's school or if I stay in? And I first looked at the Coast Guard. You know, I watched that one movie with Ashton Kutcher. He went to rescue swimmer school and I was like, boom, I'll go to be a rescue swimmer for the Coast Guard. But I joined in 08, 09. And that's when like, the housing market crashed and everybody lost their jobs and they were trying to join the military. So everything was out, like pushed out a year or so. And the Coast Guard was like two year wait to leave. I was like, I'm not going to wait that long. If I sit in this town, I could fall into a, a trap or something and just never, never be gone. So my cousin was in the Navy. I went over to the other side, looked at the Navy recruiters. We're like, well, we got a six months wait. Um, we'll put you on the debt program, get you enrolled. I was like, sign me up. You know, I'm in a month later. They're like, hey, someone dropped out. You're the next to go. If you want to go, take it. And I was like, get me out of here. Let's go. I'll go from there and kind of hit the ground running. Um, I went to school, went to the Navy, went to engine man school. So I was a diesel mechanic and I worked on the bottom of the ship. Uh, then I took over the oil lab, which was in charge of all the fuel, all the aviation fuel, all the lubricating oil for the entire ship. I did a bunch of refuelings and then I went to rescue swimmer school, which was a collateral duty. I was a surface rescue swimmer and, uh, was one of the most fun times of my life, honestly. And I'm glad that I joined the military and I've learned experiences and made relationships and it has separated me from a lot of my classmates. Truthfully, uh, I believe a lot of my classmates, I think it's just the generation. A lot of, a lot of people want to complain nowadays. And they want to like the woe is me, but we all signed up to be in this class. We all signed up yeah. to go to med school. We've been tracking for the last four or five years to get into this seat. All you have to do is study. I know it's hard, but all you have to do is study. And, you know, so that's why the military has put different things in perspective, how to manage stress, how to deal with anger, how to deal with emotions. And I think it's going to stuff I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Well, what is a rescue swimmer exactly? So if someone falls overboard, I'm the one that goes in the middle of the ocean and saves them. Oh, wow. Are you like, so you're a badass swimmer? <laughs> yeah, I grew up in SoCal and I have a pool in my backyard. So we swam every single day in the summer and even in the winter when it was good and hot, uh, swam. And I was just, I wasn't like an uh, Olympic swimmer or like a competitive swimming athlete. I played football in high school, but I was never going to quit. You know, most of that first few weeks of rescue swimmer school, they want to make you quit. They try to drown you. They make you go underwater and hold your breath and pull your mask off. And it's, you say, I can't do this. Boom. They rip you out of the pool and you're done. You're rolled. So it was just one of those things I was never going to quit. I knew that if they, they're not going to let me die. Right. I mean, possibility. Right. But I was going to, wasn't going to let it happen. So you're definitely David Goggins guy. I imagine. Right. <laughs> I love David Goggins. Uh, I was told by a resident at a program in Ann Arbor that I'm the D David Goggins of dermatology. <laughs> I was that's, like, that's I can't say that yet, but I'll take that. <laughs> that's a high compliment, man. I will tell you, man. Um, one of the best employees I ever had, her name was Rosie and she was from the, she was in the Navy before she moved to New York city. Um, there's something about folks that are in the military, man, literal team players, never yep. complain. Yeah. It's just like the best mindset. You know, just there's a job. You got to do it. You got to do the best you can at it. And it's just that. And like, you know, team sport, like elite team mm -hmm. sport athletes are kind of like, I'd say one notch down from someone that excelled in the military in terms of that mindset, you know, it's just that it's that whole team mentality, man. So anytime I, I see something 
like if I were interviewing for residency programs and I saw that you were in the Navy, like you'd be at the top of the list for me, you know, like I and appreciate worked, that. even when I was like on like doing like my fellowship and stuff, there were folks from the military from like, you know, that were like, you know, they went to the military medical school or they were serving, they're doing the residencies in the military programs and they would like rotate with us. And uh, they were always awesome. I mean, they were super chill and smart and cool, but like they just had a perspective and like, you know, just mm -hmm. a mindset, you know, hardworking attitude, but very chill about it. Just great people to be around, you know, like people that you want to work with. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I definitely hear what you're saying, but, you know, I'm sure that vibe kind of carries over when you're doing like rotations mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And it probably would speak very well for you in those, in those interviews you have coming up for, for residency. Um, all right, man. So let's get to the next part of the story. So like, you know, did the military paid for your college and stuff? Right. So there was something called tuition assistance. I could have took classes while I was in the military serving actively and they would have paid for everything, but we were constantly getting deployed. So a little jump back, just, a, just a tiny bit. My ship on the West coast was the only platform that was deployable. It was a LSD 52, the USS Pearl Harbor. And there's a there's a few of those on the West Coast that are that platform. We're amphibious. We pick up the Marines and then drop them off in Kuwait and all that other stuff. But the other ships that were stationed on the West Coast were going through their midlife crisis, which they got overhauls. So they got upgrades and all this other stuff. And my ship was the last one to get it. So that's why we went on three deployments in a four-year span. So all the stuff that we were doing, we were getting ready. We were doing this thing called in-serve and all this other stuff. I was like, I probably don't have time to go to school and do this because if I fail, then I got to pay back the military. So I was like, I'll just go when I get out. You know, I knew I wanted to go to school. There was a whole point I joined to get my school paid for. So I got out and they, I had the post 9-11 bill where they paid for my entire undergrad. Um, so I got out of the military, 2014, first generation college student, went to a community college called Grossmont, Coria, Grossmont, Grossmont slash Coria Macca in down in San Diego, uh, transferred to UC San Diego. And uh, yeah, I, I got my bachelor's in cell bio and biochemistry. And it was that around the time you got to play mountain biking? Yeah. So I spent three years at community college. I got a undergraduate studies at AS or math and science or something. And then I transferred my first year at UC San Diego. Um, a little bit before that, I fell in love with the sport and mountain biking. I've never been an addict, right? But I love working out. I love pushing myself and I love mountain biking. So I love adrenaline. And I fell into the sport of mountain biking. And I, a lot of, there's a lot of professional mountain bikers in San Diego. And I started riding with them and I progressed. I always think you need to ride with people or do anything with people who are better than you to excel and to learn. And I started riding with them and I got really good, really fast. And this one weekend I was riding with some pros and there's this, this segment that has this drop and they hit it. And I was like, oh, that's the only thing I haven't hit here. Like I've, I've hit every other jump. I've hit every other feature next week. I'm coming back and I'm hitting it. You know, I've, I've never backed down from anything in my life. I'm just going to go for it. We show up Sunday morning, March 11th, 2018. And I'm like, let's go hit insanity. Let's go hit that drop. And I'm following them. And that's not that I, YouTube footage you have, right? Was that I have some wrong? of that on my Instagram. Yeah, none of the so stuff. The from one my... that the video that's the uh, that you have on like your email, um, where your wife is talking about the accident and stuff. But then in the beginning, there's that all that footage of you. Yeah, riding mm -hmm. is that that ride yeah. or is that a different ride? Okay, that's the that's same location. Yeah. Insane man, I was like, this guy's out of his fucking mind. Like, that, that I would never, I would never do that. I don't go to roller coasters, man. Yeah, that was crazy. It's uh, I, I don't know. I loved, like I said, I've never been an addict, and I just love the adrenaline that way. Um, I love finding boundaries that I can push and find my upper limits of things, and that was something that filled that. Uh, so back to that Sunday, we meet in the parking lot, and I have a buddy who's there that we didn't invite that day, but he comes up to us and he's like. Uh, can I ride with you guys? You know, I hurt my shoulders. I'll follow you. I'll just follow behind you. We'll take it slow. I was like, yeah, we're going to go hit insanity. Let's go. So I'm following these two guys super fast and we go down this trail and they, I lose them because they're, they're, they're losing their, they're going fast. And I lost my speed because there's all these rocks and stuff. And I go to hit the drop and I didn't have enough speed where my bike stayed, the front end stayed up. It nose dove and I went straight down. And I remember like closing my eyes and being like, fuck, why haven't I hit the ground yet? And I open my eyes and I'm laying on my back and I, I'm looking up at the sky and I can't move. I can't move my lower body. And luckily, his name's Ty, comes up riding behind me. And by the grace of God, or whatever you believe me, believe he was put there to be there behind me because those guys were gone. They wouldn't have noticed I was there. You know, so I, I try to sit myself up. You know, I was tracking to get into med school and I know you're not supposed to move anyone that has any type of neck injury, but 
I thought, hey, you know, Ty sit me up. Maybe I'm dreaming and I'll wake up and I'll snap out of it. He props me up and I explain it as like my 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 lower body, my waist felt like I was on a swivel. It just felt like I was floating and pivoting. And I was like, okay, just let me back down. My hand started to lose function. He, I was like, get my phone out of my pocket. I need to call my wife. You call 911, get the ambulance, whatever. So I'm calling my wife and I've crashed. I've had stitches. I've been to the ER. I'm just as calm as I can be. I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, Nicole, I've crashed. And she's like, do we need to go to the ER? Do we need to get stitches? And I was like, babe, I can't move my legs. And she just starts screaming and crying. And I was like, I understand you're upset. You just need to calm down and get here as soon as you can. Hung up. Next thing I knew, there's a helicopter over me. They were hoisting down a guy, put me in this the sea collar in a, in, in, on a bed, hoisted me up on the helicopter, put me up into the helicopter. My wife just gets there at that moment. And she sees the helicopter flying me away. And they're like, hey, this he's already in there. This is where he's going. And next thing I know, I was in the hospital. And then what happens? So they cut me. They go down, cut me out of my jersey, my racing jersey, get me out of my clothes, put me in a gown. And I'm laying in this bed, this hospital bed, and a neurosurgeon, orthopedic spine slash neuro, he had some crazy certifications, comes in, his name was Dr. Andrew Nguyen, he comes in, and I look at him, I'm like, doctor, am I going to be paralyzed? And he looks me dead in the eyes, he's like, son, can you move your legs? And I'm like, no, he's like, you are paralyzed. And at that moment, I just remember the weight of the world just crashing on my chest and just me sinking into the bed, just felt destroyed. I was like, wow, this, my life is over. Like, I will never be able to have kids. I probably won't ever be a doctor, et cetera. And he's like, you Did know you what? You already applied gonna... to med school at that point? Like... I was tracking. I didn't apply. I was going to take the MCAT a few months later and then apply the following year. So I knew I was going to go to med school. I was, tra I was tracking to go to med school. And you graduated college at this point? Or you're still in college? No, I'm first year uh, undergrad. Oh, you're first year undergrad? Oh, this is the beginning of your undergrad. First year. Like your first... third year or whatever. Of yeah. Like first year at UCSD. At... Yeah, first year at UCSD. Okay. And... He's like, I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to, you know, go in there. We're going to see if we can remove any compressions and remove anything, blah, blah, blah. But there's no guarantee. You may never walk again. And I'm just like, holy fuck, dude. Like, I got emotional. We, we get wheeled, carted, carted out. And my wife, the nurse is like, all right, your wife's right here. She wants to talk to you. And I just like, I get emotional at this point. I couldn't even look at her because I felt so guilty for putting my life at risk every single time i went and rode that bike um so i couldn't look at her until we got into the, the icu room and we got in there and i just she looks at me and i just start crying i'm like i'm so sorry for all the all the stuff that i've done trying to be an adrenaline junkie and and, and putting myself into this situation because now this is our future you know and she was like don't ever say sorry blah 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 fast forward to my surgeries i have a block at my c7 anteriorly my whole posterior cervical spinal cord or vertebrae is fused um after that i still had little to no function so in my did legs that then and there that's what they did yeah so surgery. i went into surgery 11 p.m that night and didn't come out till like 4 a.m the next morning wow so yeah. all cervical stuff yep all cervical and then i broke t4 um but it wasn't bad enough where they needed to fuse any of that so what happens in terms of recovery after that like, can you so walk in everything now like could you... yeah Yes. You so, like I mean, I'm sure you're not probably not mountain bike. I don't know if you are. <laughs> uh, I did ride bikes for probably a year or two after that. And I just recently put them away, put the bike away. I just had no time. I had two little kids. I don't want to risk anything like that ever happening again. So how long did it take for you to like start walking and stuff again? So you, I come out of the surgeries. Uh, the doctor did comes in. Did they know you weren't paralyzed at that point? They said, hey, listen, like you're going to be able to make it with therapy at this point. Or they had no idea still. So that they had no idea. So he comes out, he we come out of surgery, comes and see me the next morning when he's doing his rounds, the doctor. And he's like, you know, I don't understand why you don't have any function in your lower body anymore. Like my left kind of came back a little bit, but my right side didn't. And he's like, I removed all the compression. There, there was compressed spinal cord. It wasn't a complete spinal cord injury. You have, comp you had a compression there. I don't know why you don't have any function, you know? So we'll go back and maybe do some, some imaging of your lower lumbar, your lower spine to see if there's anything wrong there. He, and he was like, Usually when you break so high, you don't break, you don't break anything lower as well. It's like, okay, well, I don't know. You know, this, this may be my new normal. So every day for a few days, the nurses would come in and poke me and prod me and ask me if I felt this, if I could twitch, if I could flex and do all that. Nothing was changing except for my left side kind of came back. 
And they're like, well, this may be the only thing that ever comes back. And then one day they came in and my right quad twitch. And I was like, all right, let's fucking go. This is, let's go. And I was super excited. And they were just like, hey, I know you're excited. But again, the twitch may be the only thing you ever get back. And each day they would come in and check me. And it got a little better and a little better. And the shitty thing so about how it. How many I was, days is this now, like post op? Uh, that is about 10 days. We were in the hospital about 10 days. time. Yeah. So I was in the hospital almost almost a month, just under just under a month. Wow. Um, so about 10 days, that kind of started to come back. And I think I had problems with like my blood pressure being so low because I was super athletic and I was super healthy that I every time they tried to get me to stand up and get like my bearings and strength in my legs, I couldn't stand up. I'd, I'd almost pass out because my blood pressure was so low. Um, I run like an average like 42 blood pressure as my watch tells me, but they um, – they were worried about that too. So that kind of took a while for me to kind of get my blood pressure up so I can stand without fainting and all that other stuff. But what was kind of shitty was I'm a veteran, right? I have VA insurance and the VA didn't want to pay for anything at that hospital. It was that because it wasn't a VA affiliated hospital. So I think I've taken at this point, they put me, you know, at this point I have like a walker, a neck brace, a chest brace, and like the PT belt where they hold you up and walk. You know, I think I've taken like four or five steps to the bathroom with a bunch of assistants at this time. And they're like, Hey, you got to leave. <laughs> the VA is not going to pay for anything here. You need to go home. And my wife and I were just like, what, what the fuck are you talking about? I got to go. I, I'm not walking. So they send me home and here, this is one of the, the, the changing points and what changed my trajectory mentally. I think I'm sent home that week and I lived in an apartment. It was upstairs. So I had to like help get carried. My mother-in-law flew from Florida to help my wife and, helped me get up the stairs and all this other stuff. And again, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I had to get a urinal. I couldn't get out of bed on my own. I couldn't make did food. You I couldn't sit on strength at that point. I had my hands and I could do all that, but I couldn't really, I had minimal function in my lower body uh -huh. and my wife was doing everything. And I think it was like Wednesday of the first week being back home and she has a shower chair. I'm sitting in the shower chair, the neck brace and the chest brace is off. And she's showering me and I just start crying probably the hardest I've ever cried in my life and I'm just like I'm so sorry that this is going to be your new normal you're going to be taking care of me like this for the rest of our lives we'll never have kids I'm so sorry and this is what she did she she sprayed me with the shower head in my face and kind of snapped me out of it and she's like you know what all the shit you've been through three deployments rescues from your school all the shit with your family and addiction you're gonna let this hold you back and from there on out, I was trying to do exercises on my own. I was trying to stand, sit up out of a chair. I was trying to move my legs with a band until the VA was able to put me into a, a physical therapy through the VA. And I, I was on the news and stuff. And I said this in San Diego. I was like, the reason I'm walking today is because of what she did in that shower to snap me out of that, that woe is me feeling. And sure, maybe the time would have came and I would have walked and I would have been fine. But that is what shifted the perspective of me being the poor me to get back on my feet and, and to be the person that I know I am. Wow, man. It's amazing. You got an amazing wife, man. We've been together since we were 17 and 16. So she's the, wow. she's been through it all three deployments, all the stuff with my family, the, the paralysis and, and med school. So, <laughs> so when did like things like really turn around for you? when hey okay like i can actually walk now and take so by myself and yep. that stuff that we were i think it was about two months waiting we got into the physical therapy about two months later after being from the beginning to getting into physical therapy about two months total and i walk in there and i have a neck brace and a chest brace and i have this walker and my wife's kind of just like hand behind me kind of just just there just in case and i'm just kind of like slowly getting into the, the the pt facility and i swear i walk in there and everyone's just looking at me like dude what the hell happened to this guy right like they're there for like they're older people there for their hands and some like ankle mobilities and their knees and they're just looking at me like what the hell happened to this guy and my physical therapist she was like you know no pun intended we need to get you the first thing we need to do is get you away from this walker because it's going to be a crutch mentally and i registered all right roger that the next week, I walked in there without the walker. I went around. My wife and I were doing laps around our block every single day with that walker. And then by the third day, I was like, fuck this. It's gone. I had it like on my side just in case. But I walked in there and they were, again, they looked at me like, holy shit. This guy just walked in here last week with a walker. 
like he's walking in there without it. So it was, it was about two months. And then I would say 10 months, I went to 10 months of physical therapy to get very comfortable with my hands and my feet and showering and doing all that stuff again. So like, where are you in your, were you in, take a break from school during all this or? Yeah. So that's, what's even more funny. So I had to, I was getting towards the end of finals. We are at UCSD. We're a quarter system. So we're about 10 to 12 weeks and it was towards the end and I was about to take finals. And I missed that semester, and then I missed the summer semester because I was going to or quarters because I was going to take some court summer to be ahead of ahead of my track, and then I was supposed to take the MCAT that summer, so I was basically put on pause, and I was I don't I didn't want to hold my MCAT, so I studied what I could, my best to take the MCAT, and though everything that was supposed to be on that test, I would have taken that quarter right before the summer. So I would have been prepared. So I tried to teach myself all the biochemistry. I had to teach myself all of cell bio. I had to try to teach myself all the molecular just from Kaplan. And, you know, my own cat wasn't amazing, but I took it right after I basically got out of my neck brace and chest brace. And I went in there and I took the MCAT. There's my school did an article on me. UCSD did an article of me of uh, the, the diplomas that would never quit or were not defeated. I forgot what they called it. But there's a picture of me studying in the hospital with MCAT flashcards with my neck brace and my chest brace. And, um, I had gotten back to re-enrolled into school the next quarter, right after the summer. And I took 20 units a quarter to graduate on time. So I graduated on time with my friends in my class. I took, again, it's a 10, 10 to 12 week quarter. And I took 20 units to graduate on time. So that I made sure that I graduated with my friends. Was your plan initially, like, I mean, if this, all this stuff didn't happen to go to allopathic medical school? Uh, whatever opportunity was going to present itself, yeah. you know, obviously my initial one was like MD. I didn't know what a deal was honestly until I broke my neck and I saw the opportunity that their scores were, they they took people with a little bit lower MCAT scores. I was like, Oh, I do have an opportunity to be a doctor. You know, I don't care. I honestly don't care what's at the end, the end yeah. of my initials. I still get to care for my patients and whatever it was at the time. I think I was thinking of ortho initially, but when I came into med school, um, I could still be an orthopedic surgeon. You know, I looked up and I saw there was a bunch of DOs that were orthopedics and plastics and neuro and and dermatologists. And I was like, okay, I have the opportunity. That's all I need. I just need I just need a shot. And my lower MCAT scores, I got one MD interview. It was at Northeast Ohio Med, but I had 14 DO interviews. Uh -huh. So I took the opportunity and I moved to Colorado. Um, and now I'm here. <laughs> So I mean I'm just shocked like with that story that like ortho isn't or like neurosurgery isn't like what yeah. you'd want to be doing, you know? You know, ortho was the big thing initially. I love sports. I love athletes. My wife worked for a big she's an MA. She worked for a big ortho ortho practice in San Diego and they saw the chargers when they were still in San Diego. And I was like, dude, that'd be amazing. I'd love to work with athletes on a regular basis. And then I got into med school and my wife and my daughter, I, I'm a COVID class. So my first year of med school was all Zoom. Oh. And my wife, and so I didn't have any classmates that I knew until the end of my first semester. So my wife and my daughter, before we had her second, she was four months old at the time, went back to California to spend the whole entire month in September with my family and her, her family. And I was there alone. I was like, damn, I cannot imagine going into a residency or a specialty where I don't get to see my family, where I have to work weekends, where I have to work nights, where I have to work on call because I deployed three times. I've already know what it's like to sacrifice time, sacrifice time away from family. If I wanted to do that, I'd be retiring from the military in six years. I would stay in, I would have stayed in and never had a family or had a family and been away from them and been retiring. I'm starting a whole career over at 32 because I wanted to make sure that I had time to be with my kids. Again, I come from a family that doesn't have doctors, that doesn't have anything in their family. So I'm trying to provide a future where I can still be there that my daughters know, hey, my dad was a doctor. He was a dermatologist. He had a lot of time for us. I want to be a doctor. Not where, hey, my dad was a doctor. He was a surgeon. He was never around. I don't ever want to be a doctor. I want to give them the choice to make that on their own without me inflicting that on them. Yeah. Shows wise, man. <laughs> Derm <laughs> Derm will enable you to do that. Um, wow, man. It's a crazy story. I mean, crazy on like so many different levels and like every chapter of your life has been crazy. Hopefully it's all over. It's all downhill. Oh. From, from here, man. I asked, I, I, I pray for that every single time I say yeah. 27, the year of 20, my 27th year of life was the year I broke my neck and back and went through that. And I was like, I hope nothing ever tops that ever. 
So, man, what's your advice, man? Like, well, I guess a lot of people that listen, I mean, all kinds of folks listen to this podcast, but like a lot of my audience actually like younger people. Mm-hmm. Like, um, listen to this old man, <laughs> but like <laughs> nah. high school kids and college kids and like, you know, med students and stuff, you know, kind of. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, listen, you've overcome more adversity than, you know, God, I think you're like top three of anyone I've, I've ever met at this point. Um, but you still have like such a great attitude, man. Like, you know, it, you're really like, uh, it just, you know, it effervesces from you. You know, it's just like, you know, you have this hustle mindset, like, hey, you're going to get the job done. You know, like I'm very confident mm-hmm. that you will be my colleague in dermatology one day. It's just, you know, it's almost like a no brainer. I appreciate that. Um, but and obviously, like a lot of the adversity that you had to overcome has informed that. But you obviously had that before because you overcame mm-hmm. all that adversity. Mm-hmm. So, what is like if you were to like kind of you know like my my mantra is like let's get it. You know, like, mm-hmm. if, like anyone can do it. We could all level up together. Like, what is like you know what sums you up, man? Like, what would you tell a kid who's like I, I don't think I could do this, or you know, it's just too hard, or mm-hmm. there's no way I I could never do that. Like my bad, my no one in my family's ever done that. You know, it's just not it's not for me. What I always say is do the hard things. Honestly, I wake up at 3.30 every single day. I go to the gym. I walk no matter what every single day. I drink a gallon of water every single day. And I choose to do the hard things on purpose. As humans, we really want to take the path of least resistance always. It's easy to sit on the couch and eat Cheetos and drink a soda and binge watch Netflix. And don't get me wrong, I do that sometimes. But doing the things that you don't want to do, if you know you want to go for a walk and then you're doubting yourself and you're like, ah, fuck it. I just want to sit on the couch. Get your ass up and get outside and go for that walk because that's gonna. those are the things that are going to build strength and build adversity and build grit so that when the hard things come, you'll be able to overcome them. Recently, I have a, a colleague. She's a classmate of mine. She's applying to dermatology and she was doubting everything. She's not going to get interviews. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to X, Y, and Z. And she ended up getting like 14 interviews. And I'm like, Morgan, oh, it's fine. Morgan, doesn't matter. I was like, Morgan, you have... 14 interviews. Why are you doubting yourself? And I literally, I was like, Morgan, have you ever been challenged in your life? And she's like, honestly, I have never been challenged. And I, I don't know how to answer that. She's like, I've never been challenged. I was like, that's why you're doubting yourself. That's why you're having these issues right now. That's why you, you have no faith in yourself is because you've never put yourself to the test. So I like to tell people to do the hard things to, to get out. And when your mind's telling you no, do it. I was the other day, I was, it was raining here in Southern California. It was pouring down rain. I was like, man, I don't want to walk right now. By 2 p.m., it's going to stop raining, and I'll walk then. I almost sat down. I got my ass up, put my raincoat on, and walked, went outside and went for a 45-minute walk just because I knew that myself was telling me, no, I had to go for that walk. And those are the things that built grit, and I just think that's what I would tell people to do the hard things. I love it, man. Yeah, it's it's so far. There's so many different ways to, like, say the same thing. And, you know, one of the things I always say is get your daily win every day that gets you one step closer to your goal no matter what. You can't go to sleep at night. Unless you do that. So whether it's like mm-hmm. a fitness thing, like I'm into working out and shit too. So mm-hmm. if it's a fitness thing or it's a family thing or something professionally, like you have to get that daily win, like posting to Instagram or TikTok, whatever it is, mm-hmm. whatever those daily wins are, but you yeah. have to do it no matter what, man. And then, you know, that's, you, you have it, man. You have the success. I love that. Mindset. I kind of want to, I want to jump back. You were talking about why I didn't do neurosurgery. Um, obviously that's uh, one of the craziest specialties anyways, but I did create a charity uh, it's called One Way Out, where I've right. donated about eight grand to Craig Hospital, which is one of the leading spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury hospitals in the country. And that's kind of where I hold on to my 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 spinal cord injury uh, roots and like the neuro neurology problems. That's something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I just wanted to bring that up because I may not be a neurosurgeon, but I'm still trying to help those patients in the future and will continually help those patients. I love that, man. Yeah, I did. I did. I did see that. I, 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 I'm remiss for not mentioning it, man. That's okay. Um, hey, man, listen. Uh, I'm gonna let you go prepare for your interview tomorrow. <laughs> appreciate that. Um, man, I really appreciate you sharing your story, man. You know, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but you're very open and honest, which I think that in and of itself is just so helpful to folks. You know, folks who have family members who are struggling with addiction, or folks who are in a situation like yours, where hey, I just can't afford to go to college right now. Like, there's always a way. There's mm-hmm. always away and you know, mm-hmm. i think your story really you know really exemplifies that like there's always a way man i appreciate you saying that and i just i'm open because i want people to know if i can do it you can do it i don't i don't share my story to put myself above anyone else i there's always perspective someone always has it worse than you so i want people to see look what i've been through 
and you can get through it too. So like you said, there's always a way. Love it, man. Well, I'll see you at a Durham meeting soon. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Are you going to the AD? No, you know, it's funny. Like I went to the one in San Diego the last time I was there. It actually rained every day that I was there. I was supposed to play golf at Torrey Pines <laughs> and it rained the day we we're supposed to play. Um, but you know, but I, I've been I'm an old man, man. I've been in this game for a while. Like, yeah. <laughs> The eighties just don't do it for me anymore. When I was your age, I used to love going to them. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's just it's. I'm not a big fan of any major political organization, whether mm -hmm. it be like a medical society or anything. Mm -hmm. it, all, it all becomes a bunch of bullshit, man. I've That's heard that from some people who've been in the field for a while. So yeah, so but it's fun. I mean, you should definitely go. You'll love it. Yeah. It's a good time. Yeah. Um, but you know, those days are over for me. All right. Well, thank I'm you. Just kicking it with my kids. That's that's what gives me the most joy. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, man. Listen, man. Best of luck to you. I know you're going to be a great success. I have no doubts. And uh, you know, don't forget about the little people, man. Absolutely. Thank don't, you so don't much. Forget, don't forget to look the doc up once you make it. Once you make Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks so much. Yep. Yeah. Bye.